Okay. Well, thank you all for being here today. I am incredibly honored to be with all of you right now. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be moving rather fast. And normally, I'm the person who does lots of demonstrations and throws all kinds of things into my presentations. But in this case, I'm actually just going to do some storytelling. Keep it a little bit easy, hopefully, right now, because we've got to get through this relatively quickly. First of all, I want to mention that it is actually aloha, Chris, not hello. Where's Chris at? Aloha. <laughs> because actually, if you think about it, there's a good morning here in Polish that I'm not going to attempt to say, because actually I was born in Hawaii, and therefore I can't say this, but I was also raised in Alabama, so I really can't go here right now. But I want to tell you a story actually about what it means to be here in Krakow and what it means to be in Poland. And that's because I've been here, this is my second trip to Krakow. It's my second time into Poland, and it is a wonderful city, a beautiful city. And any city you can walk by a fire-breathing dragon to come to a conference is a big win in my mind. So you guys have this amazing history, history of science in some cases, right? Copernicus here. You might remember this individual as the person who basically said the Earth is not the center of the universe or the galaxy, but the sun is the center of the universe or center of the galaxy. So this actually changed the, uh, changed the way we think about things. Fundamental game-changing theory that was, you know, in many cases considered heresy at the time. So we actually have this great history here in Poland of where someone really decided to go out there and try to change things completely. Maybe you remember this individual. His father immigrated from France, but when he came here, because of his adopted homeland, he decided to only speak Polish in the home. And this gentleman actually composed and bid, did his first public performance at age seven down in Warsaw. That's Chopin. So this individual actually also was a game changer when it came to the creation of arts, and that was also part of your Polish heritage. But perhaps the most interesting one, and most important one, is Marie Curie here, who specifically was able to come up with two uh, items on the periodic table of elements. One called uh, polonium, I think I pronounced it correctly, named after Poland. But this, uh, this lady right here won two Nobel Prizes. If you think about that, that is an amazing history that you have right here in Poland. And so I was incredibly excited to come to Poland and actually talk to you about some of these things. But we're actually going to talk to you about Java. We're going to get to that here in a second. So I just want to give you that little bit of history. Now, what's funny about this image right now is we think of Poland as an American as about vodka. You guys, you guys know that? And here's the funniest part. As I checked into the hotel last night, they were like, would you like a special local gift? I said, well, what's the local gift? They said, half a liter of vodka. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you this story right here, because we live in a world now that's actually growing very complicated. There's relatively few software developers in this world, relatively few digital creators who know what they can, who have that magic superpower to build the next new things. As a matter of fact, if you look here, there's approximately 7 billion people on this planet at this point in time. 7 billion people who all want new digital APIs, digital apps, digital assets, and we are the only people who can create those things. As a matter of fact, there's very few of us in this hall right now, very few of us at this conference right now, because approximately maybe less than 1% of the developers of the world actually go to conferences, join their local meetup, start with their local job or user group or whatever. Very few people actually focus on their continuing education. So I really appreciate that you, all of you right now, are part of those game changers who are changing the future of the world right here at this conference here at DevOps Poland. So what I want to do, though, is kind of focus on what it means to the Java ecosystem, and we're going to definitely get there. But if you look at this statistic right now, it talks about the fact that only 11%, this is surveyed executives by the MIT Sloan review here, only 11% believe the organizations have the in-house talent. Now, the good news is, you're here today, you represent that in-house talent, but it is a tiny fraction of the people out there who can be those digital creators, those digital innovators. So let's actually take you back in time for a moment. I work for Red Hat. Red Hat is a conference sponsor. Red Hat is, of course, you know, the organization I've been at as far as 13 years. But Red Hat actually started back in 1993. And it started with this thing called Red Hat Linux. And when you hear the phrase Red Hat, you probably think Linux. And so that's, that's good, right? Linux has fundamentally changed the world. There would be no concept of the cloud if it wasn't for open source Linux. There'd be no change in all our data centers, which have pretty much evolved to basically Linux data centers at this point in time. Yeah, there might still be some AIX and Solaris and HPUX, AS400s, mainframes, but if you look at all the little servers we're racking today, pretty much they're Linux servers at this point in time. But I want to make sure that you understand that Red Hat is not only Linux. Red Hat certainly loves Linux, and that's critical, and this is part of our new branding, our new, new logo. But we actually love more than Linux, and that's an important thing to understand. We also love this thing called Kubernetes. 
And so tomorrow I'll be doing a three-hour deep dive into Kubernetes and talking to you about what it means to use Kubernetes as part of your application architecture. We also have this thing called OpenShift, which is our distribution of Kubernetes that you can get support for today. But we also fundamentally love Java. I want to make that very clear in this presentation. We have invested heavily in Java over the last 13 years. I was part of the JBoss acquisition that came back in 2006, and Red Hat continues to invest heavily in Java, both in the form of OpenJDK, as well as a new technology I'll talk about today called Quarkus, which leverages things like Grail VM, Growl VM, I should say, to basically give you native Java. Okay? All right? So all our little Red Hats there. So this is definitely a form of evolution. So let's also take you back one more uh, time in history. And this actually goes back to this thing called 1999. This is my favorite movie in 1999. It's called The Matrix. You remember that? The opening scene where Trinity, you know, raises up in there and spins around that room. That was amazing. And that was actually a game-changing digital technology yet again. Changed the way we think of movies at that point in time. But it was a phenomenal movie, and this is actually our top songs from 1999. Certainly you remember these. Okay, you might not remember Cher, but you remember TLC at least, hopefully. Okay? And of course, the U.S. wins the FIFA World Cup in 1999. Anybody remember that? What? Really? <laughs> well, hold on one second. We actually have a game today. We won the first three games in the group stage, a 17 to 0 goal differential. Okay? We have won the World Cup before. And yet, for some reason, especially at programming conferences, we can't remember that. So I want you guys to think about that for a second because we have to change our mental model a little bit. It's not only fellows, boys, men who play this game, okay? But I want you to go back to 1999 for this one reason. In 1999, for those who were in this career path back in 1999, if you decided you wanted to build a new web application at this point in time, you would actually cost you about half a million dollars to get started and about $90,000 just to keep it running. And that just gave you two servers, one for your database, one for your application server. You had to get your web logic, your Oracle, and of course you had to spend thirty or $50,000 on your IDE, and that's what it cost to get started to build Hello World for the web back in 1999. And I used to do that as a consultant. It was actually very lucrative back then at that point in time. But I want you to remember that because things have changed now that we live in this new cloud native world. We no longer spend half a million dollars to get started, we can spend about 20 cents an hour to get started. 20 cents an hour to try our thing on the internet and see if it works or not. So that's an incredibly powerful change to our ecosystem. Of course, this was based on Linux. Linux made it uh, accessible, made it possible in many cases. But now we have all this open source technology that we can take advantage of and light up our next generation idea easily and quickly. As a matter of fact, we've been evolving along this path for quite some time. We actually, this huge time series, I could spend a lot of time talking about these things, but we don't have time in this session. But if you look at it, Java was born in 1996. And of course, we had Java EE. We had this thing called Linux, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux born in that same time frame. We had this concept of Linux containers. And of course, we had Docker, we had Kubernetes. We had all these innovations that happened from, let's say, 1996 to 2015. And of course, that fundamentally changed the way we think. Because back in 2015, when we launched Kubernetes to the world, right? So Red Hat's been part of that Kubernetes ecosystem for a long time. We actually chose, in that demonstration, to launch 1,026 containers, those 1,026, live on stage. And here's the part that really gets me about that point in time, because I was the person who organized this event. We had launched 1,000 containers, Linux containers, with a little application inside them in two and a half minutes. In order to get that done, we had to use this thing called Node.js. There was no way in hell to have done that with Java. Java was too fat, too slow. And so we had thought about this for a long, long time, since that point in 2015, and we came up with this new concept called Quarkus. And so I'm wearing the t-shirt right now, the supersonic subatomic Java. And this Java allows you to build a traditional, let's say, enterprise-style Java application, or non-traditional, a fully reactive or fully event-driven application, and to compile it down to a native executable leveraging something called Grail VM. Now, there are different reasons why you might want the native versus the traditional JVM, and Quarkus supports both, okay, just so you know. But if you truly have that fast startup time requirement, like you see in a serverless architecture, like you see in a microservices architecture, like you see in event-driven architecture in that cloud-native world, then you might want this sort of thing. Now, it's funny. When I, we announced this just back in March of this year, people said, why are you bothering investing in Java? And I had to respond. This is actually on the internet. I can give you the links to it. Someone was like, why would you even bother doing that for Java? Java's dead and gone at this point. 
And Java actually is not dead and gone. Java is incredibly successful and continues to be so, and it's proof right here in this room. The Java conference ecosystem, like Stefan and Chris just announced a moment ago, is continuing to grow around the globe. We have more people showing up for more Java events than ever before in the history of Java. Okay, and so I think that's amazing. Java actually represents either the number one or number two programming language at this point in time, alongside JavaScript. And of course, there's still so much goodness in this ecosystem. We have so many awesome frameworks and tools and technologies and utilities that make all this ecosystem up. That is why Java is so fundamentally robust and Java is so fundamentally popular. Now, here's the challenge. With all these flavors, all this to consume, Java puts on weight. And that is really where the problem lies. It's not specifically in the JVM nor in the Java programming language. It is actually in the frameworks it consumes that makes it start up so slowly, that makes it use so much memory. And that's the way you should think of it. And we noticed this when we put Java in a Linux container. You didn't care when you owned the half a million dollar stack of hardware. You owned the hardware. Use all the hardware. Now that you pay 20 cents an hour, you start counting the memory. You start looking at a startup cost. You start wondering how many CPUs you need for that application. Because you see the cost and it's OpEx operational expense, not CapEx. In other words, it's dollars you spend every month so people notice. So when you put Java in a container and then you try to constrain it like you normally would in a container, like if you would a Python or Node or Go or some other programming language, Java by default, Java 8, would blow up. I did that presentation a few years ago. I, would, I can still blow it up today just by simply putting the constraints on a Linux container around Java and you'll see it die. And of course, that's problematic when you have a whole bunch of these things running across your ecosystem. So Quarkus was the Red Hat evolution, the Red Hat revolution, if you will, to make Java and the associated frameworks that you need to build real robust applications smaller and faster than ever before. Okay? So in other cases, what we're talking about here is 10x smaller, 100 times faster approximately. Of course, your mileage will vary based on what you're benchmarking against, but you're gonna see an amazing change to the Java ecosystem where you can actually have a Java application that is smaller and faster than Node.js. And so I'll show that later in my breakout session later today, right? So literally, a Node.js application is actually bigger and slower than a Java application. I want you to think about that for one second, because we've had situations, and I've had these personal conversations, with numerous developers who are like, we have to leave Java, and we're moving everything to Node because we're going serverless, or we're going to microservices, we're moving to Go, because Java is simply too fat and slow in a situation where we're changing the application, running a CICD deployment pipeline, and redeploying it through Kubernetes and Istio every day. It, doesn't take, it takes too long to start up Java in that context. So we had to think about that. We had to think about the developer experience in terms of live reload. You can edit code, basically edit, save, refresh, edit, save, refresh, just like you would if you're a Node.js developer, which is fundamentally game-changing for developer experience. We have the imperative and reactive programming model, which I'll, again, I'll show a little bit later today. You can build this for serverless architecture, and I'll show that as well, running on something called Knative on top of Kubernetes or other serverless architectures. And of course, it's optimized for the experience that you need for building real enterprise-style applications. Okay, and again, it's vastly smaller, vastly faster. Now, we talk about Kubernetes, and I mentioned that Red Hat loves Kubernetes, and this is also fundamental to how we think of this. Again, we had that one application that we benchmarked several years ago where we had to run 1,026 containers, and by the way, you're probably wondering, why 1,026? It has to do specifically with the fact that my designer wanted that many tiles on that screen you saw earlier. So we had to launch 1,026 containers in two and a half minutes, and that was hard. And we did that on Kubernetes, of course. Now, we also have been thinking about these frameworks, too. And there's a bunch of frameworks that have already been migrated to this new cloud native, Quarkus native, Grail native world, as you see here. And what we're here today, though, is to tell you about three new things. So I was hoping to have something to announce today, and we do. And so there's something very special that just came online. Actually, the Perl request, I think, is still pending, maybe. I don't know if you, if you see her in this room. But we actually have this thing called Cogito, where you can specifically have declarative business logic. If you're familiar with the Drools open source ecosystem, or the JBPM open source ecosystem, declarative business logic, which specifically means you can export, if you will, the business rules, if then else logic, or the business flows associated with your application into separate files, external from your Java application, being able to change those without changing Java code, and again, still take advantage of this native runtime environment. 
So that's a new thing. You'll see a break, breakout session from Mario and company a little bit later uh, this week. There's also another technology called reactive messaging coming out of the microprofile ecosystem. And this is where we've married the worlds of Kafka and AMQP with the same programming model, with a simple incoming outgoing programming model that you will see again in my breakout session later, that makes it easy to handle streaming-based technology. And a third thing that just came out in the last couple days is of course Kafka Streams, but now running, okay, Kafka Streams clients now running in this native executable environment. All right, so three incredibly uh, huge innovations. We've been innovating at a rapid pace on this project. It's only been born as of March, but we encourage you all to come join us and actually check out the technology and maybe make your own contribution like the three you saw here. And uh, you've noticed my diagram there with the stream of cockroaches. You guys get the reference for Kafka? Maybe not. Okay, all right, we're almost done here. So what I wanna do is take your attention back to these three individuals. Because again, everybody here in this room right now is an incredible digital innovator, a digital creator. You're the few people that have that superpower to put hands on keyboard and create net new things the world has never seen before. But if you look at these folks, they have some great quotes that I want to share with you as we close here today. This person right here talked about the fact that we have to know what we know. And I know as computer scientists, as software engineers, you know what you know. But the real secret is to don't, when you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> in other words, understanding that you have these blind spots in your ecosystem of knowledge, that you have this gap in what you don't know, and you have to understand that, and you're constantly filling that in. That's incredibly important. Or maybe you have to understand that simplicity matters more than anything else. And so Vincat has a great presentation he does on simplicity, but I want you to be thinking about that. Making it as simple as possible is the final achievement. Great quote from that individual. But last but not least, certainly not least, one can only see what remains to be done. I think that's actually very powerful. It certainly speaks to me. When I think about, you know, do I celebrate the current victory or do I simply look at what's next? And you might be thinking, well, what is next? But I particularly like this one right here. And that is, nothing in life is to be feared, only to be understood. And so now is the time to understand more so we can fear less. That's incredibly powerful if you think about it, and certainly changes the way, you, and, and certainly a huge factor with why you're here today and at this conference now, here to learn, here to gain new knowledge and gain new information. So there are a bunch of sessions from the Red Hat team specifically that you, know, you should go check out. Like I said, I'll be doing a presentation a little bit later to show you those different aspects of Quarkus, the programming model, how to make it fast and slow, how we start up an application in milliseconds as opposed to seconds, and of course deploy it up in containers up in the cloud as an example. But there will be many sessions that drill down on Quarkus technology, or the Kajito technology we mentioned, or the reactor programming model, or various other things you'll see here. So definitely check out those different sessions. There's also sessions from Chris as well. He'll be talking about GraalVM. I think Oleg is here talking about GraalVM as well. So make sure you check those out as well. Now, this is the end. Well, really, it's the beginning of our story. I want to leave you here right now, but I want to thank you all so much for your time. I want to make sure that we get to the next speaker, but if you guys, did you guys like what you saw here? Like what you heard here? Yeah? Well, I am way over time, but again, thank you so much for your time today, and I hope to see you later. Feel free to come find me at the conference, and I'm happy to show you all kinds of cool stuff. Again, thank you so much.